Let's go ahead and get started. Um, I know everyone's really busy, so as folks join us, they can um, get caught up. But you know, welcome everyone um, who's joined us for the Stop Penny's Pipeline campaign update webinar. We really appreciate you taking the time and joining us today. My name is Kristen Zilkowski, and I'm the Director of Digital Engagement with New Jersey League of Conservation Voters. And for those of you who don't know us, New Jersey LCB protects our natural resources by working with our allies like Rethink Energy New Jersey to advocate for strong environmental policies, to hold our elected officials accountable, and to mobilize the public to protect the health of our communities and the beauty of our state and our economic future. Now, I'm absolutely thrilled to have our partners from Rethink Energy New Jersey join us. We have Tom Gilbert and Patty Kronheim with us today to provide updates on the Penny's Pipeline. You know, Rethink Energy New Jersey does absolutely incredible work and they are true experts on this issue and stopping the Penny's Pipeline has been one of their top priorities. So before we get started, I just wanted to go over some housekeeping items. We are gonna pause to answer questions about halfway through the presentation and again at the end. So please do ask questions or if you have any technical issues, just use the chat button to ask those and we'll do our best to answer as many as we can. And so with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Tom and Patty to uh, introduce themselves and talk more about what's at stake. Great, well thanks very much, Kristen. I wanna thank you and everyone at the New Jersey League of Conservation Voters for, um, for co-hosting this webinar with us and more importantly for everything that you've been doing um, in the campaign to stop Penn East, you have uh, truly been a, a really tremendous and important ally. Um, I'll just introduce myself briefly. I'm Tom Gilbert. I'm the campaign director for Rethink Energy in New Jersey and also New Jersey Conservation Foundation. I'll let Patty introduce herself. Hi. Thank you, Kristen. And uh, thanks to the League of Conservation Voters for presenting this opportunity for people in the greater community to learn more about Penn East. Uh, my name is Patty Kronheim and I am the Outreach Coordinator for Rethink Energy New Jersey. So what we're going to do here briefly um, is um, give you a, a, an overview of the, of, of the Penn East issue and the campaign. Talk a little bit about you know, what is Penn East. We may have folks on here with varying degrees of knowledge about the issue. What is the proposal? Why is it such a threat? Uh, what, you know, what, why should people be so concerned about this and, and, and fighting it if, if you're not already? We'll talk a little bit about where things stand um, and, uh, and importantly, how you can plug in and, and be a part if, uh, if you're not already and, and what lies ahead. Um, first, I just wanna say a word about Rethink Energy in New Jersey, which is a campaign that was launched by New Jersey Conservation Foundation, the Watershed Institute and the Pinelands Preservation Alliance. And the mission of the campaign is to foster a swift transition in New Jersey to clean, efficient, and renewable energy, and uh, to reduce reliance on fossil fuels and unneeded pipelines. And we also support the environmentally sound uh, planning and siting for uh, renewable energy infrastructure. Rethink Energy New Jersey was, was formed in large part in response to pipeline overdevelopment. Um, it's, it's, it truly is um, uh, kind of eye-opening when you look at the amount of uh, fossil fuel infrastructure that's proposed throughout New Jersey. New Jersey already has five major interstate pipelines, over 1,500 miles of pipelines, and there, there are a multitude of, of uh, proposals throughout the state, new pipelines, compressor stations, power plants, Penn East is just one of them. Uh, but you can see from the map, there are projects really that are threatening um, really really every, every corner of the state and every community from, from uh, you know, rural to suburban to, to urban. And, um, and there's significant evidence that New Jersey already has uh, excess gas capacity, um, more than we need, I mean, in specifically, um, in the coldest, win coldest days of this past winter, experts have found that there was 1.7 billion cubic feet of excess gas uh, capacity flowing through pipelines out of the state to point south on the coldest days of the winter. So we don't need more. 
Now, getting to what is the Penny's Pipeline specifically, Penny's Pipeline is 118 mile long, 36 inch diameter, 1480 PSI pressure, that's the pressure pipeline, uh, with, which would have a 50 foot permanent right of way. It is what's called a greenfield route. So it's a completely new route. It's not going along existing gas pipeline routes. Uh, it would um, transmit 1 billion and that is billion with a B, cubic feet of frack gas per day. That's its capacity. And it would go from Luzerne County, Pennsylvania, down into my hometown of uh, Hopewell Township, Mercer County, New Jersey. So it actually would starts in the area of Pennsylvania where gas is fracked in the Marcellus Shale. And then it comes down into, as the map, uh, you can see on the map in front of you, comes, crosses in, uh, around Holland Township and goes all the way down through uh, into Mercer into Mercer County, and uh, it's an interstate pipeline it crosses state lines. So it is regulated by the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission, which you'll be hearing more about in this webinar, uh, and and then it is also regulated by state agencies and departments of environmental protection as well. Now, on the basics of who is Pennies, because Pennies is was created solely for the purpose of this pipeline. There, there was no company Pennies before this. Pennies uh, is made up now of uh, what's going to be just four companies. There used to be six. Uh, PSE&G pulled out, um, and then Southern Company uh, was recent is re being acquired by South Jersey Industries. So the four companies that are going to be remaining. Uh, as soon as that, as soon as South Jersey industry buys Southern Company, which is Elizabethtown Gas, will be New Jersey Resources, which will have 20%, uh, Spectra Energy, which is a um, midstream company that does uh, pipelines and uh, gas, gas pipelines and storage nationally, and um, UGI Energy Services, which is a Pennsylvania company. So uh, they all have 20%, except for SJI, uh, South Jersey Industries, which will have 40%. So 60% of this pipeline is going to be New Jersey, uh, owned by New Jersey companies. So that's who makes up Penn East. Tom, you want to talk about I think why, this we is you, Patty. why we care? Oh, okay, well, I thought it was you, but all right. Well, this is why we care. This is just an overview of the impacts that uh, why and why we care. So the reason that we care and that we're all here talking about this um, are there's a multitude of reasons. One is that Penn East would uh, traverse and, and take uh, open space paid for by taxpayer dollars that we've preserved uh, for the health of the state, uh, not just because it's beautiful and not just recreational, but also the health of our water. It would also take uh, people's property through eminent domain. It's a threat to our water. It's a threat to wildlife. There are safety risks uh, involved with Penn East. And of course, there's climate change risks uh, as well. And all of this uh, would cost ratepayers more money, not less. And uh, the biggest, one of the big, all of this for something that's completely not needed. So those are the basic impacts we're going we're gonna to cover. Over to you, Tom. <laughs> so on the issue uh, of open space, and, and I'm going to put on my New Jersey Conservation Foundation hat on for a moment. Um, this, is, this is really the issue that, you know, first drew us in, and we learned all the many other reasons to oppose, oppose this pipeline. Um, Penn East would cut through and damage over 4,300 acres of preserved open space and farmland. And those are lands preserved by the state, by the counties, by uh, municipalities, by private land trusts such as ours and others, and most of them preserved with taxpayer dollars. And um, the pipeline construction would have both very significant impacts to the scenic beauty and natural resources of those lands, the reasons for which they were set aside, but it's also really undermines the integrity of the preservation programs themselves. And people have been shocked to learn, some of the, the landowners who preserve their farms have said to us, what do you mean that my property is not protected from a pipeline? How can that be? I thought I had set it aside and preserved it for future generations. And, and how, how, you know, how can this possibly be? So it is, it's a real affront to open space preservation itself. 
And one of the biggest problems with Penn East that presents for New Jersey are the risks to our water. Uh, Penn East uh, would cross a myriad of what's called a myriad of what's called C1 streams. And C1 streams are the purest streams in the state of New Jersey. And they're designated as such because they are clean and they are important to our drinking water. And they, they uh, feed into our drinking water supplies like the Delaware Raritan Canal, which is what the streams at Penn East impact would, uh, would create. It. And uh, it also is a risk to our wetlands. Penn East would cross many wetlands. And it also puts our groundwater at risk. Uh, many of the people, almost all of the people on the Penny's Pipeline route in New Jersey are, have wells. So any risk to our groundwater would impact those people's ability to have clean drinking water for their wells. So you can see from the map on the, um, on the, on the left with all the little blue squiggles, all those little blue squiggles are C1 streams. And that's how many crossings there are for Penn East. Uh, so that, and some of them are crossed more than once. So this, this is a real um, risk that uh, we all should be very concerned about because sometimes they try to go under them with what's called HDD drilling, which is a horizontal directional drilling. Um, but horizontal directional drilling doesn't always work. They also wanna do that with uh, the wetlands. Some of the wetlands go under with HDD. I want you to see the picture on your right is what happens when HDD fails. And this is a picture of the Rover pipeline in Ohio in 2017. And this, the fluid they used to do the HDD drilling is called bentonite. And that fluid, um, a teaspoon of it probably wouldn't harm much and isn't toxic. But if you dump 2 million gallons, and that's what this is, you suffocate, actually suffocate a, 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 wet, a wetland. And as I said, it's, it's a myriad of streams. It's uh, 33 C1 crossings by the land amount, by the way. And then in terms of um, what else can be the harm to stream is that they can cut the trees uh, and ruin what's called the riparian zones, the riparian buffer zones on the streams. And some of these crossings are gonna be trench crossings where they just cut right through. And they have to cut the trees when they do this. And then you cut those trees, um, you ruin the buffers to the streams. And those buffers create shade and help protect the streams. And that leads to an increase in temperature. And all these things impact the quality of the streams and the drinking water. Um, the other uh, thing that's at risk is the, the groundwater, as we said, and, and Tom's gonna talk about one of the specific risks of this, but in general, a lot of ground is porous, and when the water um, drips down and the rain comes down, it just sort of seeps down to an aquifer, but much of the ground around Panis is bedrock. It's hard, and that rock has little channels that feed aquifers. So when you mess with stormwater runoff, because you're creating this huge swath of, of cut, which is 50 foot permanent, but it's 100 foot for the construction, plus there's more for storage. So those are very large swaths that are gonna be cutting. When you make those cuts, you change the stormwater runoff, you're blasting, you're changing those channels, you, t you risk people's wells being able to have water, and you risk the water, um, supply and regeneration of the aquifer systems. So I'm gonna let Tom, not to get into too much more detail about water, but you can see it's a very, Penny's presents a very big risk. I'll let Tom talk about one of the biggest. So one of the major threats is, uh, is arsenic contamination of both um, groundwater and streams. You can see from this map that this area of New Jersey is already an arsenic hot zone. And that's really a function of the underlying geology that is rich in arsenic. Um, there are numerous scientists, including a uh, professor of geosciences from Princeton, T.C. Onstott, who have submitted um, uh, information to the agencies stating that in their professional opinion, both the construction and ongoing operation of the pipe pipeline would pose a very serious risk of elevating arsenic levels in an area where there, those, those levels are already, already elevated and, and in some cases approaching sort of threshold levels. So this, uh, this, is, a real threat to, uh, this is a real threat to drinking water. One of the other threats um, is that it's a natural gas pipeline, highly pressurized pipeline. So these pipelines in New Jersey generally run around 800 PSI. Pennies would be 1,480 PSI. That would make it the single highest pressure pipeline in the state of New Jersey. 
And no matter what Penny says about, oh, we're building this the safest standards, what they're really saying is they're building it to what the federal standards say they have to build it to. And I want to state very clearly, that is nowhere near as safe as what New Jersey regulations would say a pipeline has to be built at in New Jersey. Because it crosses state lines, they can use the federal regulations. So pennies could be built to class one location. They're going to build it to a class, what's called class two location. New Jersey requires pipelines to be built to class four location. That means, and what the class location is, it's, it's a classification that determines things like how deep is the pipe buried? How thick is the steel that the pipe is made of? How many inspections does it have to have? How often do you have to do things like run a pig through it, which are those internal um, devices that check the status of a pipeline? All of these things are impacted by what class location. And Penny is only building this to a class two location. Now this is a pipeline that would go, you know, a mere hundred feet from people's bedrooms, you know, in the middle of people's lawns. There is no safe place if you're within a quarter mile of this pipeline. As this map could show, this is the crossing, a map of the crossing of where it would go uh, when it gets to Hopewell. It would cross, uh, and I want to thank Debbie Kratzer up in Kingwood for making these maps. Uh, but uh, this is the Pennington Circle, which we know how many cars go through the Pennington Circle. And you can see there are communities right around that. If you're within a quarter mile, you have a 50% chance of mortality in 60 seconds. All right. So in half a mile, you have a um, what's called the thermal impact, where you, you may not die, but you might have burns. Um, on blisters around your body. So these are, these are very severe impacts, if anything were, God forbid, to go wrong with this pipeline. But they're not even starting out building it as safely as, as they can. And we're seeing an increase in pipeline accidents in the country that we have not seen since the 1940s. And that's because they're putting pipelines, as Carl Weimer of the Pipeline Safety Trust says, they're putting pipelines in the ground so fast that, they, that you have to question whether or not they have the qualified experienced crews to be doing this the way they should be. Because that's why we're seeing this big spike in new pipeline um, incidents. So one of the biggest issues obviously is climate change. Uh, Penn East would be the equivalent of 21 million tons of carbon emissions each year. And that is huge. Now that, to give you an idea of what 21 million tons is equivalent to, that's like 10 million cars or 14, 14 coal plants. So Penn East is not good for helping you know, preserve uh, our, our climate and get, and get it with, keep, uh, keep us within those levels we need to be to uh, keep a climate change from accelerating. I mean, we know that climate change is real and we know we have to do everything we can to move to renewables and away from fossil fuels as quickly as possible. And Penn East clearly takes us in the opposite direction. And then as Patty said at the outset, um, the real kicker to all of this is that uh, there's very significant evidence that there is just no public need for, for this pipeline. Um, that's the conclusion of uh, international gas experts at Skipping Stone, who've done multiple studies. Again, the most recent one looking at on the coldest days of this past winter, uh, there was no need for additional gas capacity, not even on a single day. And this is really what Penny's points to as their, their claim of, uh, of need for the project is that, um, you know, that, that, that you know, there's this unmet, unmet demand, and it's just simply, simply not the case. That finding was also reinforced by the New Jersey ratepayer advocate, the, in, the independent utility consumer watchdog in the state, uh, who found no evidence of need for the project, said it would be unfair to ratepayers, and that the 14% rate of return, which is guaranteed by FERC over 15 years, would be like winning the lottery, and that's really what's driving this project. You're muted, Kristen. Thank you. So I just want to take a minute and open it up to questions. So we just covered a lot of, you know, really important information. So before we move forward, does, if anyone has a question, just as a reminder, please click the button with the word chat. 
and ask your question to everyone. Oh, and we can keep moving, yeah. Great. Okay. So we're talking a little bit about where things stand now. Um, I should I should note that this has already been a very long process. It's been uh, about four years um, since wow. this whole process began, perhaps a bit longer. Um, everything has been largely with FERC up until this point. Um, they, uh, they did finally issue early this year a certificate of public convenience and necessity. Um, despite, um, you know, all the evidence that was put before them from the experts that I alluded to in terms of there being no public need for the project, despite having little to no data on what's actually on the ground and the impacts in New Jersey and, and a highly flawed environmental impact statement, um, they did what they typically do, um, and they they issued a certificate. Um, they've 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 earned a reputation for for being a rubber stamp agency, and that was very much um, the case on Penn East. One of the things that 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 certificate triggers is their ability to seek to use eminent domain, uh, um, and it's it's kind of mind boggling because the FERC certificate is conditional, and Penn East can't go forward without a host of other approvals and permits, including the Department of Environmental Protection, the Delaware River Basin Commission. But despite the fact that the pipeline is not approved, they're still able to go to federal courts and seek eminent domain to both get access to the land that they have been unable to get access to and take the, the properties they ultimately need to construct the pipeline. Um, and they, they did that in March of this year. Um, and they file condemnation papers on nearly 150 properties, uh, about two thirds of which are, are owned by private landowners and the other uh, third by um, preserved lands uh, by the various parties that you see and that we've discussed. Um, and this, you know, a lot of this is very much a function of and, and a tribute to the incredible, strong, united opposition um, from individual landowners, from, um, from, from the communities themselves, who have refused over many, many years to uh, cooperate with Penn East, to have refused to grant survey access, have refused to negotiate any voluntary rights to them. And that's really what, what, um, what uh, forced Penn East to, to seek to use eminent domain on such a large number, uh, a large number of, of properties and has caused them great delay uh, both in the FERC process, um, and now they're tied up in, in court. And even though the court, uh, they began their court filings in March, here it is almost July, and there's been, there's been no court decision. Um, so a decision is expected from the courts at any time now. It's anyone's guess whether that happens quickly or takes a while. And the courts will decide on two issues, whether they get immediate access uh, for surveying the properties that, where they've been denied access and whether they're able to take um, you know, take title to, to easements uh, for, for the corridor. One really encouraging, additional encouraging um, development in all this is how aggressive the state of New Jersey has been through the state attorney general's office. So the state first refused to negotiate anything voluntarily to Penn East and then uh, aggressively defended, uh, has aggressively defended against the taking of, of any properties where the state has an interest in court. So that's been really encouraging to see and then in addition to that, the Attorney General's office also filed um, uh, a petition in federal court to challenge the, the, FERC, um, uh, the FERC certificate. And many other parties have as well. There are hosts of nonprofits who have similarly filed uh, challenges against, against FERC's, FERC's decision. Uh, in addition to that, the New Jersey Conservation Foundation and the Watershed Institute have a broader constitutional challenge filed against FERC uh, not, not just exclusively on Penn East, but in general, their practice of conferring eminent domain, which we've uh, alleged is, is unconstitutional. And that challenge is also pending in court. Uh, if we could switch to the next slide. Thanks, Tom. I think the sign sort of says it all. Uh, New Jersey can stop Penn East, no doubt. Yes, FERC uh, issued the certificate which we expected that they would, as Tom said, and yes, there are all those legal, legal cases, but just think that you've got a private company for private profit 
armed with this FERC certificate in court against the state of New Jersey and two counties and five towns and all these landowners and NGOs. So now we're waiting, as Tom said, to see what the eminent domain uh, decision will be. But ultimately, what has to happen is that the state of New Jersey needs to decide whether or not they're going to issue the water permits. The state of New Jersey has the authority under the Clean Water Act, and that is not preempted by FERC. So they are the administrators of the Section 401 water quality and the 404 wetlands permits, which Pennies would need in order to be able to construct the pipeline. The certificate that FERC issued is conditional upon those permits. Now there is really good precedent for these permits being denied and stopping the pipeline. The Constitution pipeline was denied its 401 water quality permits by the state of New York. So the state of New Jersey can do the same thing with Penn East. They can deny the permits. So that is a really big uh, next piece. Um, the fight has come to New Jersey. And as the sign says, New Jersey can stop Penn East. And we fully believe that if New Jersey, simply by following the regulations and science that at, at its disposal, it will be able to stop this pipeline because this pipeline does not meet New Jersey's strict environmental regulations. And that's, that's the bottom line. New Jersey can stop this. The other authority uh, that has uh, a say in this is uh, that it would impact pennies is the Delaware River Basin Commission. And the Delaware River Basin Commission is, has now got the pennies application. Uh, they're starting to review it. There haven't been public hearings yet. We trust that there will be vigorous public hearings and review. And we want them to actually, you know, to, to exert the full, the full um, measure of their authority when reviewing this pipeline. And uh, so we're counting on them to also do the right thing and do that. I think the next slide. So what can you do? <laughs> well, there's a lot you can do. And uh, with League of Conservation Voters and Rethink Energy, we, we uh, have uh, actions already up uh, on our, on our um, uh, Rethink website. We have a way to contact the governor uh, so we have a letter to the governor that's up. There will be upcoming DEP hearings uh, that we, we want everyone to come out to. Now, obviously, the applications aren't even in yet from Penn East to the DEP because they don't have the survey information. This is going to be a very long process. But when the time comes that there is DEP hearings, we definitely want a lot of people to show up because that's the most important thing, showing up. There'll be upcoming DB, uh, DRBC hearings, the Delaware River Basin Commission hearings. You can write to your legislators. You can write letters to the editors. We really encourage people to write in your own words why this matters to you. That's so important. Uh, you can sign on to petitions. I know the League of Conservation Voters uh, is, is great at getting out petitions and probably doing more of those. You can post a lawn sign. We have a lot of lawn signs, the ones that you saw on the last slide. We have those and uh, you, can get, you can get those from us as well. And you can follow Rethink Energy New Jersey um, and, uh, and uh, League of Conservation Voters on, uh, on all of our various uh, ways of following us. And I just want to point, this, was, this picture is just with a bunch of us were in a field. It's just, these, these are just local people who spontaneously came out. People had done, you know, done um, wonderful banners and things and people just came out because there's so much feeling about opposing this. People in New Jersey do not want to see more pipelines in the state. They want us to move to renewables. So this is some of our contact info. Um, it's online, rethinkenergy.org. Uh, um, actually, I'm, isn't it rethinkenergynj.org? Wow, I might have that wrong. But if you Google Rethink Energy, you will, you will get us. Uh, Either Energy. works. Either works. It works. Yeah, okay, it does work. That's right. It just threw me. Uh, and of course, njlcv.org for their website. We both have Twitter, Twitter handles, so you can follow us. Please follow us. Uh, we like to tweet things. We like to retweet what you tweet and are interested in what you all have to say about things as well. Um, you can go to Facebook, Instagram, YouTube at Rethink Energy NJ or at NJLCV. And also, we have an action alert that you can do if you want to be, to be informed for places you can show up. And we only use this if there's something to actually physically go and be present at. Uh, text the word renewables 
to 797979. That's 797979 and type in the text renewables and you will get information about where you can show up when there's a hearing or, or a rally or something that you might want to be a part of. That's great. Right. Go ahead, Tom. I see we have a couple questions. Do we have another minute or two to, to briefly Please. answer? Yep. Great. Okay, I see we have a, a question on, on the eminent domain issue and, and the constitutionality of that. Um, it's very complicated. Uh, we, we have a, a lawsuit filed against FERC and there are about five different uh, counts as to why um, we view their, their broader practice of conferring eminent domain as constitutional. But one of, the, one of the main points is that, as in the case of Penn East, the pipeline developers are able to file for eminent domain when a project is, does not have full approval. And in fact, the environmental review really hasn't even been completed because that environmental review, to a very large extent, is carried out by the states, not by FERC. And so, so why should a pipeline developer have the ability to get eminent domain and seize land for a project when the environmental review has not even been completed, when the project has not been fully approved, it may be denied, it could be changed. So to seize private land for a project at, you know, given those circumstances, um, we view as, as unconstitutional. That's just one of about five different counts, which I can't get, I can't get into all the details, but uh, I believe you can find more on that if you go to the Rethink Energy New Jersey website and, and look for the, the press release around the, um, some of the litigation. Um, what's the second, what's the difference between the natural gas, uh, Elizabethtown gas versus Penny's pipeline? Yeah, um, so I guess you're referring to the gas pipeline currently in place with Elizabethtown gas. Is that, is that a question, distribution versus interstate pipelines? I mean, Elizabethtown gas does not uh, run interstate pipelines. Elizabethtown gas is a New Jersey entity that has what's called distribution pipes. They're much smaller, um, they're lower pressure. They're what run to your home, uh, to, you know, uh, they're, the, they're the ones that are the small pipelines that run just in the state connecting, uh, connecting um, the, uh, they can go to a, a, a grid, they can go to a power plant, or they can go to a community and go into homes. Those are distribution lines, if that's what you're talking about. And those are very different. Those are regulated mm -hmm. um, under uh, the BPU, the New Jersey BPU, under New Jersey's regulations, whereas interstate pipelines are regulated under the Pipeline Hazardous Material and Safety Administration, which is federal. Those are the ones, the big interstate ones are the ones that have the less safe um, requirements than New Jersey has. So that's it from a safety perspective. But one's big interstate, one is uh, small distribution. Great, excellent. Well, thank you so much, Tom and Patty. Um, we are just so, so happy to have you join us today. You know, what a really excellent presentation. Obviously it gives everyone a lot more information about what's at stake and what we can do. And I wanna thank everyone who joined us today. Um, we really appreciate your time. And obviously we really look forward to working together in the months and years ahead to stop the pipeline. And there is one final question if uh, Tom or Patty wanna take that and then we'll sign off. I think that's a question for Patty. Well, could you I can't see it, so you can Oh, okay. It? It's a safety. I think it's uh, New Jersey requires a pipeline to be B4 and Penn East is B2. I think these are, these are the, um, the, the safety classifications that you referred to earlier. Can you touch on that again? Um, C4, as in CAT, C, class four versus class two. Um, class four location pipelines are, the, are built to the more stringent uh, requirements, have because the way they look at it, they say, the more people you have living around a pipeline, the more, uh, the safer the pipeline has to be built. So New Jersey decided uh, in, uh, long ago, in 2000, well not long ago, 2009, that it was after an explosion that we are the most densely populated state in the country and there is nowhere safe to put a pipeline at anything less than the safest standards. So we have, to, we require all in-state pipelines that don't cross state lines be class four. That means the steel is thicker, it's buried deeper, and there are twice as many inspections. Those are just three of the big, uh, pieces on that uh, and I'm happy to if anyone has more
questions about you know detailed safety things, they can reach out um, to me personally at Patty at RethinkEnergyNJ.org, and I'm happy to answer safety questions. And the the, inter the interstate pipelines like Penn East is only being built to C2 class location, which means thinner steel, less inspections, doesn't have to be buried as deeply. Wow. Thank you, Patty. Well, thank you, everyone. And definitely, we also thank, uh, we are working with so many uh, state and local partners who have been, you know, at this fight for years and years. Um, so we are just so honored to work by your side and look forward uh, to continuing to, to fight this really important fight together. So thank you again for taking the time and I hope everyone enjoys the rest of your day. Thank, thank you. you, Kristen. Thank you to all the people who signed up to the renewable seven nine seven nine. I found right. it's going off, so you'll be in the uh, you'll be in our in our list, and we'll let you know what's going on. Thanks, Thanks everybody. Thank you.